Magandang araw! Welcome sa isa na namang episode ng online series ni Inang Pamantasan, kung saan ang pagkatuto ay walang hangganan. Ito ang PNU Talks. Ako nga pala si Aragon Decimo Jr. at ako ang inyong learning from home buddy sa episode na ito. Ngayong araw ay pag-uusapan natin kung paano nakakasama sa kalikasan ng pagtatanim. I-comment ang inyong mga katanungan at mga kuro-kuro tungkol sa ating episode ngayong araw. Huwag kalimutan i-like at i-share ang episode natin. Hello! Again, my name is Aragon Decimo Jr. And today, I'm going to show you that tree planting is not always good for the environment. This also includes being a plantito and a plantita. I'm going to walk you through my personal advocacy of having the right mindset and correct understanding in all our attempts to be environment friendly, particularly in our tree planting activities. You probably already know that trees and forests in general provides us various benefits. You also probably know that in the conduct of tree planting activity itself, it also offers many advantages. But did you know that sometimes, or in most cases, tree planting activities has been the cause of forest denudation and the slowing down of forest recovery, and in effect, harming the environment? We will try to understand how come that a good intention results into harm and bad for the environment. Are you ready? Let's get on with it. When tree planting is not always good for the environment. The burning question for this topic is, what makes tree planting bad for the environment? I have prepared four basic ecological principles that have always been overlooked or even ignored that resulted into the silent tragedy in our environment. These are reforestation instead of forest restoration, monoculture, invasive alien species, and the wrong species and the wrong place. Reforestation instead of forest restoration. For the sake of our discussion, reforestation and forest restoration is more of a mindset rather than the literal meaning of the terms for they could take different interpretation given different context. Again, what we'll be talking about this first component is all about um, more of a mindset. How do you look at the tree planting activity or the tree growing activity? Is it from the uh, background of reforestation or is it from the background of forest restoration? By definition and meaning, reforestation is a generic term for replanting trees in a specific area with various goals, including ecological restoration. The restoration concept relates to a more complex and essential process that assists the recovery of an ecosystem that has been degraded, damaged, or destroyed. In another definition, reforestation is the reestablishment of forests and woodlands that have been destroyed or usually due to deforestation or forest clearing. In short, reforestation is the restocking of the plants or the trees regardless of its resulting landscape, even if it is a monoculture or, or, or made up of different species for as long as there is the restocking of the degraded or the lost tree in the area. Reforestation through planting trees on cleared land is an important mechanism that leads to tree cover establishment. However, not all tree planting activities lead into the tree cover increase. There's even very little information about the success of reforestation. And sometimes the failure of, of reforestation can be attributed into three reasons. Trees may have not survived or they have been rapidly destroyed or the three species that were planted were not actually welcomed by the local communities. According to the study of Blair Smith and Herborn, 
a number of problems with past deforestation projects can be identified because reforestation projects have often sought to encourage and sometimes impose tree planting without understanding why the trees disappeared in the first place and without attempting to address the immediate underlying causes of forest loss. Second, there has also been um, a mismatch. Mismatch between the social and ecological goals of reforestation. It is either the reforestation has aimed to fulfill social or economic needs without reference to the ecological goals, or it has had a narrow conservation aim without taking into account the social and economic needs of the people. So I think we have to take note of these two things. One of the main reasons why reforestation failed is because we are only hitting one aspect. We are not looking into the environment and both the socioeconomic. Sometimes we are looking from uh, the conservation aspect only. And sometimes we are only looking from the uh, socioeconomic or even the economic aspect only. So that is actually a good formula for the failure of reforestation or even any attempts for reforestation. I believe there is a great need to understand fully the objectives as to why reforestation is being done. For foresters, reforestation traditionally meant establishing trees for a number of functions like wood or pulp production, soil protection. For many conservationists, reforestation is either about restoring original forest cover on degraded areas or about planting corridors or of forest to link several protected areas. And for many interested in social development, the emphasis always of reforestation is on establishing trees that are useful for fuel wood, fruit, or as windbreakers and livestock enclosures. It's all about the development and the well-being. Forest restoration, on the other hand, is aimed to restore a degraded forest to its original state and to re-establish the presumed structure, productivity, and species diversity of the forest originally present in the site. Second definition, forest restoration could also mean that it is a complex task complicated by diverse ecological and social conditions which challenges our understanding of forest ecosystem. So it is also simply telling us that the forest ecosystem is not merely ecological. It also involves the social conditions that should be clearly understood before you embark yourself into performing some of these forest restorations. A good attempt for reforestation or forest restoration requires a view expanded beyond the technical to include historical, social, cultural, political, aesthetic, and moral aspects. If you would try to look at it, in order for you to approach or attempt performing the forest restoration, the approach should be holistic. The approach should always be bringing all of these things. You should not only coming from one component, but instead you should have all of them in your backpack so that you could have a good result for your forest restoration. And I believe missing any of this and not consideration of any of this is actually the reason why maybe our efforts have been so futile that the tree planting activities, instead of doing good for the environment, we are adding harm into it. In a nutshell, forest restoration aimed to return the natural forested and the recovery of forest ecosystem, not just for the sake of the tree cover, but instead bring back the different species that have originally existed in the area. In another study by Le, Smith, and Herbon, they have grouped the potential success drivers of forest restoration. I'll be discussing to us about success drivers of forest restoration. This simply imply that if you neglect any of this, could lead into the failure of forest restoration. There were actually four categories that they did for the potential success drivers of forest restoration. The first one is the biophysical or technical biophysical. Second is socioeconomic. Third is the institutional. Fourth is the reforestation project characteristics. Let's try to look into each of these. For the technical and biophysical drivers, you would always look at it looking at the biology, 
chemistry and the physics of planting site, including the plant species. This involves the site species matching, the tree species selection, site preparation, seedling production, quality of seed and seedlings, appropriate time of planting, technical capacity of implementers, post-establishment silviculture, and site quality. For the site species matching, it is actually a prerequisite for promoting good stand growth and maintaining long-term sustainability. It is actually always a prerequisite. It's always very important. Without site species matching, whatever you do in your reforestation attempt, it will not succeed. The selection of appropriate species to meet livelihood and generate additional income for investment in reforestation is the key to long-term sustainability of reforestation initiatives. Because for farmers, reforestation means moving away from their current land use practice. Site preparation. It involves the suppression and removal of weeds and sometimes cultivation and fertilization to aid the successful establishment and growth of the tree seedlings. For the seedling production, Tree nurseries can provide optimum care and attention to seedling during their juvenile stage, resulting in the production of healthy and vigorous seedlings. Of course, it's also important to choose good quality of seeds or seedlings because a good quality of seeds or seedlings is free of disease, has a straight sturdy stem, a fibrous root system that is free from deformities, a balanced root and shoot ratio is hardened to withstand any adverse conditions of the planting site with good carbohydrate reserve and nutrient content and should be inoculated with symbiotic microorganisms when necessary. For the appropriate time and planting, it is always crucial because this directly affects the survival of the seedling in the field. That about the technical capacity of the implementers, this affects both the short-term and the long-term survival of the planted areas and also the tree growth and the quality of tree products. For the post-establishment serviculture, if not managed properly, weed can cause reforestation failure through competition and through increased fire hazard and shelter for pest animals. Livestock grazing is also a common cause of reforestation failure in the tropics if there is no maintenance, if there are no people looking after the seedlings until they reach maturity. For the site quality, site quality is the sum of the climatic, geologic, and endophic factors that influence tree growth at a specific location. That is for the first drivers, the technical and the biophysical drivers of success for uh, forest restoration. Now, let's look into the socioeconomic component, the socioeconomic drivers of success for the uh, forest restoration. This involves livelihood planning, local participation and involvement, socioeconomic initiatives, financial and economic viability, payments for environmental services scheme, social equity, corruption, degree of dependency on the traditional forest products, marketing prospects, knowledge of market to timber and other forest products and services, and addressing underlying causes of forest loss and degradation. I will start to discuss with the addressing underlying causes of forest loss and degradation. Remember, when we are doing forest restoration, the area or the site that we have chosen should always be the denuded one, the one that has been uh, degraded because of several reasons. So maybe one of the first things that you need to consider is looking into the socio-economic component wherein what do you think is the reason why the forest were depleted in the first place? What are the socio-economic factors that has actually contributed into the reduction of this forest? And this should be really addressed. For the livelihood and planning, Enhancing activities must be part of reforestation plans and project development should always address the needs of the people in the area. We have to take note of that in order to ensure participation and interest in sustaining the project. Remember, in order for you to keep the people involved, you should always offer to them what's in it for them. And that is the second component there, local participation and involvement. Tree planting programs are most successful 
when local communities are involved and when the people or when the people perceive clearly that to achieve success is also in their own interest. They would always ask, what's in it for me? Sometimes we might be doing some tree planting activities or tree growing activities for the sake nga because of the project that was actually implemented in our offices, in our universities, in our campuses. And sometimes we go with it maybe just for for the fun of having it. But the people who are actually in the area, they should always see what's in it for them. Because if that is not answered, that would always lead into the failure of our efforts, the waste of money spent and resources spent in the performance of the activity. For the socioeconomic incentives, unless direct economic or indirect incentives are provided to the local communities, their involvement is not likely to be sustained. And then we also have to remember that the local community's involvement should always be sustainable. So in order for us to be able to do that, the incentive should also be sustainable. And consequently, the viability of the forest restoration program will be reduced. For the financial and economic viability, projects should have long-term income generation and reinvestment plans from forest products or from livelihood Scheme. So in, in performing the reforestation or, or forest restoration, the scheme should always be thinking of how can this move on on its own. For the payment for environmental services scheme, this is actually one of the schemes that is implemented to, to incentivize even the efforts of people who are doing the uh, forest restoration activities. The type of goods and services that restored forest can provide and that can be quantified. This includes the payment for carbon sequestration, watershed protection, and biodiversity conservation should always be monetized or given an economic value that the people who are participating into it should get reward from, from all of these things. Social equity market and non-market costs and benefit need to be shared by all stakeholders. Social equity mentions that everybody gets a fair share of both the benefits and the cost. Corruption always play a large role in the success or failure of reforestation projects. For as long as there is corruption, it plays a vital role in the success or failure of any efforts and attempts for forest restoration. The degree of dependency on traditional forest products stimulates people's participation in forest management. A higher level of forest dependence means that the people have a higher stake in the forest, which is reflected in their level of participation. The third driver is the institutional policy and management. Institution and management drivers can serve as both the catalyst of the development and the success of forest restoration or could also be detrimental, cause the failure of the attempt for forest restoration. For the institutional arrangement, a strong and appropriate institution support is critical for promoting investment and local participation in forest projects. The major characteristic of good governance are the rule of law, Responsiveness, transparency, effectiveness, efficiency, consensus orientation, participation, equity and inclusiveness, and accountability. These components should always be seen because if these are not practiced by those who are implementing and managing the forest restoration, this could have that effect. The last driver is the forest project characteristics. Of course, it starts with the project goals and objectives, project implementers, project location or accessibility of sites, project size, project funding, project life cycle, and then the private and public land. All of these things should be taken care of and should always be uh, put in the right place for the uh, implementation of forest restoration. All of these things will then lead to and should result into environmental success and socio-economic success because as we have learned earlier the contribution or the contributors into the success and failure of the forest restoration are always revolving into these components socio-economic and the ecological or environmental component and so the success should always be seen in the socio-economic success and environmental success
how do we see and know the environmental success? These are the indicators that we can see. First, vegetation structure for the, for the environmental success. The vegetation structures as seen in their canopy cover, canopy height, ground cover, shrub cover, and even uh, the status of the vegetation. Second, species diversity. The tree species richness, the presence of desired tree species, appropriate wildlife presence, and special life forms, and weed abundance. The third one is ecosystem functions, the regulating function, supporting function, and the provisioning function of the ecosystem should be very evident and seen. Now, for the indicators of the socioeconomic success, this involves increased income, local employment opportunities, other livelihood opportunities, availability of food and fiber supply, stability of market price and locally produced commodities, local empowerment and capacity building. Now, I want us all to look at this again. On the first place, when we were discussing about the failure of reforestation mindset, and the success drivers of forest restoration mindset is always revolving in these two components, the socioeconomic and the ecological or environmental components. Does this sound familiar? This actually tells us about the three pillars of sustainability, the social, the economic, and the environment. If one of these is neglected, that would not result into a sustainable community. In the use of fancy words, the social, environment, and economic component or pillars of sustainability are termed as people, planet, and profit. Which is why these three components are enumerated in the 17 SDGs. Going back. If we are to compare these two mindsets, reforestation mindset and forest restoration mindset, remember, and we have to take note, that the reforestation mindset is all about restocking regardless of the resulting landscape. Whereas, for the forest restoration mindset, it is to return the natural forested area and the recovery of the forest ecosystem. Reforestation is all about bringing back the tree cover. Forest restoration mindset is about bringing back the original state of the forest that is lost. So, more appropriate and more successful if our mindset in approaching any activities like tree planting, tree growing, should always be having this kind of mindset that is not just about putting back trees and bringing back the tree cover. It should always be restoring the forest into their natural forested setup. The second reason why planting trees could be bad for the environment is monoculture. Monoculture, by definition, is a common form of reforestation and its end point is very different from the original forest because a single species is planted. A professor of the University of Sao Paulo by the name of Pedro Brancaglione said, Today, reforestation projects are basically only concerned with the number of trees planted. It's like it's the end goal. This study describes the secondary forest to where monocultures are usually planted. This is actually understanding more about what is a secondary forest. Secondary forest growth is often apportioned into three general stages, beginning with a rapid colonization of a fast-growing herbaceous and shrub species, succeeded by the short-lived pioneer trees, and long-lived pioneer trees achieve dominance once the short-lived species die. In practice, antagonistic site conditions such as intense prior land use, distant seed sources, impoverished soils, or seasonal fire cycles can constrain forest recovery. Secondary forests perform important services, stabilizing topsoil, improving soil chemistry, reducing nutrient leaching, sequestering carbon, producing timber and non-timber forest products, regulating climate, improving landscape, hydrology, and conserving biodiversity. Secondary forests have the capacity to ameliorate or even prevent predictive mass extinctions in the tropics 
by means of providing large-scale biodiversity refuge that increase in value over time. Secondary forests commonly develop naturally on land abandoned by shifting cultivation, settled agriculture, pasture, or failed tree plantations. So, secondary forest is promising a solution to the problem of forest denudation and problems associated to it. Which is why, global expansion of plantation is largely attributable to tropical plantings. Approximately 90 million hectares of tropical plantations existed in 2005, and the vast majority of which were planted as monocultures. Monoculture or monospecific plantations actually have poor ecological, edaphic, and ecological credentials. They also have poor soil chemistry, slow biomass, and lower timber yield compared to polyspecific plantation. Monoculture also have more expensive carbon storage and biomass production compared to polyspecific secondary forest or secondary forest which is actually made up of more than one species. And the tropical deforestation is actually associated or found associated with the extensive establishment of tree plantations, particularly the monoculture. Let's try to learn one example. China's Grain for Green program. In response to a series of devastating floods in the late 1990s that killed more than 4,000 people, the Chinese government embarked on the most extensive tree planting effort the world has ever seen. The Grain for Green program, or also known as the GFGP, which is actually launched in the 1999 with the primary goals of mitigating flooding, reducing soil erosion, and boosting the livelihoods of the rural poor in western China. The government provided households with technical support, cash and food in exchange for planting trees in areas of degraded farmland, especially those most prone to landslides and erosions. A 2012 study found that runoff decreased and the soil erosion significantly decreased because of the increase in the area of farmland converted forest lands. Many of the trees provide timber, fruit, and other forest products, enhancing the livelihoods and local community. And while mitigation of global climate change was not a principal target of the program, research showed that GFGP largely increased soil organic carbon stocks. However, in 2018, a study led by Beijing University's Fang Yuanhua, while she was at the UK's University of Cambridge, determined that as of 2015, gross tree cover had grown by nearly a third with 1,935 square kilometers newly tree. That increase was due almost entirely to degraded farmlands being converted into monoculture tree plantation of one single species, like bamboo, eucalyptus, or Japanese cedars. Native forests had declined by 6.6% .6 or some 138 kilometers square at the same time. Thus, instead of truly recovering forested landscapes and generating concomitant environmental benefits, the region's apparent forest recovery has effectively displaced the native forest, including those that could have naturally regenerated on land freed from agriculture. After that study, many other studies came up looking at the effects of the Rain for Green program of China to the environment. Of course, tree plantations cannot compare to native forests in terms of their capacity to support wildlife and provide other ecological services. Another example of a case is that of the oil palm plantation in Southeast Asia. This involves several countries. One study the impacts of oil palm plantation established in the habitat type, species, diversity, and feeding yield of mammals and herpetoflora. The results of the study indicated that the establishment of oil palm plantation negatively impacted species abundance and the diversity and changed the mammal and reptile species composition by favoring ecological generalist species. Some of the mammals and the reptile species are actually um, Specialist. That means to say, they feed on specific types of food or prey. Of course, if you compare them with the animals that are generalist, the survival of the generalist species is larger compared to that the slim a survival tendency of a specialist species because of the abundance of the food becoming scarce into not available. Another study has surfaced the ill effects of oil palm plantation, a review on the ecosystem's function in oil palm plantations using forest as a reference system. The research showed that oil palm plantations generally have reduced ecosystem functioning compared to forests, 
11 out of 14 ecosystem functions show a net decrease in the level of functions. Some functions show decrease with potentially irreversible global impacts like the reduction in gas and climate regulation, habitat and nursery functions, genetic resources, medicinal resources, and information function. Research also showed that most serious impact occur when forest is cleared to establish new plantation and immediately afterwards, especially on peat soils. Another study, the land use conversion from peat swamp forest to oil palm agriculture, greatly modifies microclimate and soil conditions. In understanding the peat swamp forests, they form in areas where saturated soils or frequently flooding prevent organic material from fully decomposing. So instead of these organic materials into decomposing because of the presence of water, they are prevented from decomposing totally. As this organic material slowly accumulates because they are prevented from, be from decomposing, it retains even more water through capillary action for up to 13 times its weight, acting as a giant sponge that holds in the moisture. Peat swamps eventually form a dome of wet organic material that can rise above the surrounding flood levels. That is a peat swamp. And these peat swamps, according to the study, some or most of the peat swamps in the area were converted into oil palm plantation. A recent inventory of forest found that 45% of the mammals and 33% of birds identified in the pit habitat are listed by IUCN as their near threatened, vulnerable, or endangered. Soil characteristics were also significantly different between the pit swamp forest and oil palm plantation with lower soil pH, soil and ground cover vegetation, surface temperature, and greater soil moisture in the peat swamp forest compared to that of oil palm plantation. Another study, mixed species versus monocultures in plantation forestry, development, benefits, ecosystem services, and perspectives of the future. These are several impacts. The first impact that was covered by the study showed that monoculture results in two social impacts. What are the impacts of monoculture in the social aspects or social component? The introduction of large-scale plantation often leads to the change in the ownership of the local communities into large private companies, hence resulting into loss of traditional goods and cultures, customary rights and livelihoods associated with, with forced resettlement, and an equal distribution of resources. The environmental impacts also involves the loss of soil productivity and fertility, disruption of hydrological cycles, risk associated with plantation forestry practices, risk of promoting pests and diseases, higher risk of adverse effects of storms and fire, and negative impact on biodiversity. Soil depletion causing soil erosion and degradation, not efficient in trapping nutrients because fewer roots exist near the surface, which may further lead to significant loss of nutrient from the harvest sites. More susceptibility to pests and diseases. Lower levels of biodiversity than surrounding native forests, and some of them have considered exotic monocultures as biological deserts. More susceptible to pests and diseases, it's because they all have the same genetic designs. So whatever is the fault in the genetic design of at certain monospecific plantation, pag isang disease lang mag-affect sa isa, that means to say, that disease could affect everybody or everything in there. So that means to say, isang disease lang could, could destroy everything in it. Whereas, if that is a um, polyspecific plantation, one disease cannot destroy all the plants, cannot kill all the plants, but instead, there are still other chances because other species could still thrive into that condition. Here, biological deserts describes monoculture. It is because monocultures actually eliminates the abundance of various food for several species of fauna. That in effect, the monoculture plantation will serve as like the desert that is not able to provide food for any fauna that is thriving in the area. Completely opposite. Monoculture is completely opposite to diversity. 
monoculture is found to be poor habitat for native birds. And monoculture have lower resistance to biotic and abiotic disturbance aggravated by the changing climates. In the end, monoculture will always have low ecological benefits and more danger to the native species and environmental conditions. Invasive alien species makes tree planting activity detrimental or bad for the environment. Invasive alien species are defined as the non-native plants that can cause adverse effects which pose major threat to plant and biodiversity conservation and sustainability. It is also considered to be one of the major drivers of biodiversity loss and thereby altering the ecosystem services and socio-economic conditions through different mechanisms. Furthermore, invasive alien species are plants, animals, pathogens, and other organisms that are non-native to the ecosystem and which may cause economic and environmental harm or adversely affect human health. They also impact adversely upon biodiversity, including the decline or elimination of native species through competition, predation, or transmission of pathogens, and the disruption of local ecosystems and ecosystem functions. Invasive alien species includes exotic and non-native micro and macro species introduced accidentally or deliberately to a place that is not part of their natural habitat or distribution range and have adverse ecological and economic impacts. Lastly, the definition of invasive alien species are exotic species, especially those that were introduced to an area with no natural predators or competitors, will flourish in their new habitat. This study shows us the impact of invasive alien species. Anthropogenic disturbances are the prime factors responsible for biotic invasion. I want to give emphasis into this one. Anthropogenic disturbances are the prime factors responsible for biotic invasions. People, we are still and will always be the source of the problem. But you know what? We can also be the solution to this problem. If human-mediated disturbances will be continued in the long term, there may be emergence of new invasive alien species hazardous to environmental and human health. Let's take the example of the native Australian acacias in South Africa. In the 19th century, South Africa began planting non-native Australian acacias to stabilize dunes and produce timber. But the acacia quickly spread across the wide swaths of South African native grasslands and heathlands, lowering the water table and reducing water availability. It's because acacia are having this great consumption of water. The country now spends millions of dollars every year to remove the troublesome trees. This is a clear example of where exotic species used in monoculture plantation got out of hand because they are invasive and cause problem into the place where they were introduced. So, as you can see, this is still somehow related into the previous reason, the monoculture and now the invasive alien species. Another study surfaced several impacts of invasive alien species. Competition for light is actually crucial for the successful establishment of the tree seedlings. And this establishment of the tree seedlings will be hampered and affected when invasive alien species are, are planted or introduced in the area that are uh, growing faster and are getting more light, reducing this light available for uh, the seedling species or the, the native tree seedling species. Another impact is the chemical impact on regeneration. Invasive alien species changes the chemical biotope or uh, the living space of organisms. The chemical living space of organisms, characteristics of the native environment, nutrient and or water cycles, disturbance regimes or natural succession. All the other processes involved or the chemical processes involved in the living space of the organisms when invasive alien species are introduced, they are altered, they are affected, and they cannot proceed with their natural processes. Because alien plants alter chemical and biochemical soil properties and cause changes in the native species richness, usually the effect to the uh, native species is that they become thinner, they, they reduce in their uh, number of species, and both above and below ground. Other than the chemical impact, there is also physical impact on regeneration. 
Same thing, invasive alien species changes the physical living space or biotope characteristic of the native environment, nutrient and or water cycles, disturbance regimes, and natural successions. Because invasive alien species changes in soil humidity due to the invasion by alien plants. Structural impact on regeneration. Invasive alien species also changes in the structural living space characteristics of the native environment, nutrient and or water cycle disturbance regimes or natural succession. So in effect, if you would try to look at it, the invasive alien species are affecting the, the chemical, the physical and the structural conditions of the living space of the native species in the area resulting into um, the changes in the richness of this um, native species and the domination of this invasive alien species. Another example is the Matenge or the Prosopis juliflora in Baringo County in Kenya. When Prosopis juliflora was introduced to Kenya's Baringo County in the 1980s, it was heralded for the benefits it would bring to the area's pastoral communities. A native of arid lands in Central and South America, the woody shrub, known locally as Matenge, was promoted by the Kenyan government and UN Food and Agricultural Organization to help restore degraded drylands. At first, the species helped prevent dust storms, supplied ample wood for cooking and construction, and provided fodder for animals. But after the El Nino rain of 1997, things changed. Matengi seeds dispersed widely, and without any local fauna adapted to eat the foreign tree, it spreads aggressively. See, this is now the start of it becoming a bully because there are no animals adapted into eating their seeds. Their seeds continues to spread and in effect, they grew everywhere. Impenetrable thickens overrun grazing pastures, displacing indigenous biodiversity and depleted water sources. The tree thorns pierce the hooves of livestock, while its sugary pods cause tooth decay and loss, sometimes leading to starvation among animals it was meant to nourish. Again, this is another example of an invasive alien species introduced into the area with a different purpose but with lack of understanding of this type of species. This has now become the problem and have made trouble into the environment, the local environment to where it was introduced. Another study, this concerns more of the introduction and knowing of the invasive alien species here in the Philippines. In our country, early introductions were intended for food production, reforestation, horticulture, and recreation. Again, very clear that human actions are the primary means of invasive alien species introduction here in our country for whatever reason it is. The IUCN Invasive Species Specialist Group Global Invasive Species Database list 47 alien species that have been introduced to the Philippines, 6 with biostatus uncertain, and 23 that are native to the Philippine region and invasive elsewhere. Here are um, 7 of the worst invasive plant species that are found in the Philippines. Hagunoy. This is Hagunoy. The water hyacinth. As you know, this has become the problem in the freshwater areas like the Pasig River and other river systems in Luzon. They cause the flooding because they clog the river flows. Then the Hetagi Banghelensis. And then the Kugun grass. We have the Kugun grass here. And then we have the Baho Baho in our dialect. This is Baho Baho or Coronitas. The Ipil Ipil. And we also have the Makinia micranta. These are the seven worst invasive plant species found in the Philippines. They are almost uncontrollable and wherever they are, it's very difficult for other species, particularly the native species, to thrive in the area. One example is that of the kugon. When kugon grasses is present in the area, you all will not see any other species thriving with it because the kugon grass spoils the soil and does not allow other species to grow with it. And burning alone cannot actually solve the problem. Burning them alone cannot solve the problem. They really have to be uprooted. And uprooting them plant by plant requires a lot of work and a lot of expense. That same research actually showed that numerous alien plant species have successfully invaded natural and human altered habitats through deliberate and accidental introduction in the Philippines within the past 400 years. 
Research also have shown that many ornamental plants are aggressively spreading out of control across the Asian region. So this is actually somehow not only about the tree planting, but also being a plantito and plantita could also cause trouble and problem in the environment because the intention of beautifying our our gardens and our areas, we are introducing invasive alien species. And if these species are left unattended, they, they would uh, disperse and they would actually displace all some other native species in our uh, backyard, in our uh, area, and even into our forest. Say Salpinia Volkirima. We have also the Blue Trumpet Vine, Morning Glory, Ipomea Kairika, Bougainvillea, and the Thai Vine. Exotic colonizer shrubs cover huge areas of many regions here in the Philippines. We have the Piper Adonkum, Mimosa Pigra, and then the Prikipir, or also known as the Oponcia Manacanta. Nature reserves and parks in Luzon are dominated by the attractive South American shrub, or commonly known as the Cardinal's Guard. If you put them into your garden, unknowingly these plant species are invasive and would somehow um, take over take over the landscape several species of australian eucalyptus and two species of acacia grow well in southeast asia and spread naturally how much more if they are planted intentionally these plant species acacia uh, mangjum and acacia aurif auriculiformis naturally thrive how much more if human intervention is made or given just to plant them exotic tree species that also host insect pests Chimelina, si Acacia mangjum, si Mahogany, and then the Eucalyptus. These are the four common plant, fast-growing plant species that are hosting insect pests. One of the disadvantages of this invasive alien species. Forestry species planted in the country were identified as bio-invasive based from local and international sources. These are some of the bio-invasive plant species. Of course, again, we have the, the mahogany, we also have the giant ipil ipil, we also have the palo santo, and then acacia auri, African tulip, the same species that is actually found in Kenya, the prosopis uh, juriflora, and then the paper mulberry. So, invasive alien species are among the top drivers of environmental change globally and are known to threaten food security, human health, and economic development. So, invasive alien species are not doing us any good. That is why, as much as possible, we avoid encouraging their growth by utilizing them in our tree planting activities. So it is also very important that we know what plant species to plant, what tree species to plant in all of these activities that we do. Because if we don't know and we don't try to understand what are the plant species to plant there, we are wasting our efforts and our energy. And instead of doing good for our environment, we are doing harm. So invasive alien species have been mentioned consistently that they were introduced to the Philippines and intentionally and deliberately. In short, they are both anthropogenic and human-made. So introducing them through a tree planting activity is highly dangerous to our biodiversity and native species and eventually impact our socio-economic well-being. Tree planting could do harm to the environment when we choose wrong species and plant them in the wrong place. When a marine biologist saw an old man about to plant mangrove seedling in a channel in Giwan, Eastern Samar, this is after the Yolanda, this is actually the effort of the government into reforestation of the mangroves that have been um, destroyed by uh, Storm surge, eastern summer, the biologist panicked. The man was about to plant a species of mangroves called Rhizopora, more commonly called Bakhau, in seagrass beds, a completely different ecosystem from mangroves 
and home to a different set of organisms. But how do that naturally grow in the channel in the fishing village of Namitan? Instead, Pagatpat or Soniracha alba and Piapi or Abyssinia marina, the, these are the mangroves that thrive there. Planting the mangroves that had never been there, the reforestation only replaced one valuable habit with another less valuable one. Sa gobyerno naman yan! Bakit sila magtuturo ng mali? That is actually the statement of the old man after being confronted that what he's about to do is wrong. Many even have called the Department of Environment and Natural Resources-led program unscientific and rushed because maybe of the deadlines. The government is rushing the program to meet targets and planting the wrong mangroves in the wrong areas. We are seeing this in one of the examples that I have presented. But my question is, have you been doing this also? Have we been planting wrong species of mangroves in the wrong area or even in the, in the sea grass beds? Not all mangroves are created equal. One mangrove species is favored ignoring the suitability of the species for different sites. Mangroves are replanted in inappropriate areas like seagrass beds, mud flats, rocky shores. Stop the non-scientific planting on old coral beds, seagrass, and mud flats according to Dr. Georgine Primavera who was named the Time Magazine Hero for the Environment in the year 2008. Mud flats according to her are where aquatic birds feed during low tide. Seagrass beds are feeding grounds and nurseries for marine turtles, seahorses, dugongs, coastal fish, and shellfish. They also buffer waves and improve water quality. The preferred species for government-sponsored distillation is bakau for the reason that bakau propagules are easy to plant, not requiring a 3 to 6 months nursery phase like the piapi and pagatpat. Its propagules, around 60 to 80 centimeters in length, are also large and thus more visible. They grow into the image of mangrove most Filipinos are familiar with, large, pipe-like roots, forming arches above the water. But while the back house glorious root make it appear sturdy, it is in fact not suited as a frontliner mangrove. Backhaw roots cannot withstand strong waves or wind action. They either hide behind the pagatpat or piapi or line inner tidal rivers and creek according also to Dr. Primavera. Based on the tidal zones, there are mangrove plants like the pagatpat or soniracha alba that grows well in the lowest part of the zone where the substratum is sandy and exposure to the seawater is highest. And there are species like bungalon or the Abyssinia marina and the bakawan or the risopora sp that thrive better in the middle and upper part of the zone that have a muddy substratum and lesser exposure to the sea. As you can see in this example, this is actually coming from the presentation of Dr. Primavera. The Soniracha alba should always be in the part of the front liner because they are actually resistant to wave attenuations and even the strong winds. Planting the wrong mangrove species in the wrong place can be useless and wasteful. Let me say that again. Planting the wrong mangrove species in the wrong place can be useless and wasteful. That's why we have to be careful in choosing where to plant this mangrove species and what species to plant. An example, in a 63 hectare mangrove reforestation area in, in Ibisan Capiz, for instance, the planting of Bungalon or Abyssinia Marina in the low intertidal area did not work out because the transplanted seedling had a very low survival of only 5%. In addition, a heavy infestation of barnacles and filamentous algae smothered the plants. Imagine a 63 hectare plantation with only 5% survival rate. What was, the, what was wrong in there? They chose the wrong species and planted it in the wrong place. Whereas, an example here in the 7 hectare area of Ibahay, a clan, Pagatpat or Soniracha Alba was planted in a 7 hectare seafront area in Ibahay, a clan that enjoyed 50 to 80 percent survival rate. What was the good practice there? They chose the right species and planted it in the right place. Wrong species, wrong place. It is vital to fully understand and practice the planting of the right species to the right place to avoid misplaced efforts and resources and harm the environment. Tree planting, even intended to be good, can do harm if you choose the wrong species and choose to plant in the wrong place. You must be thinking, tree planting lang naman yan? Kailangan ba talagang pag-isipan yung mga ganon? 
Or maybe, do we really have to think that replanting or being a plantito and plantita could be bad for the environment if I have reforestation mindset instead of forest restoration mindset? If I prefer to plant a single species resulting into monoculture or I choose invasive alien species over the endemic or the native tree species or if I choose the wrong species and the wrong place because I find them convenient? The answer is yes. We just have to remember that in the first place, our objective of planting trees is for the good. And we also have to think that when things are intended to be good, it must be done right. Sa muli, ako si Aragon Decimo Jr. at sumain ang PNU Talks.